All right, let's begin. Uh, today I'm going to do a couple more examples of using the method of variation of parameters. And then we're going to begin talking about the material we'll be covering in the third stage of the course, namely second order autonomous systems of equations. And in some sense, in some ways, this is kind of a fun part because the equations that we'll be studying for the most part will actually not be linear. But nevertheless, we'll be able to make a lot of headway, both using analytical methods that I will be showing you, but also using the program, J-O-D-E, the program that solves pairs of coupled ODEs. So I'll describe all this to you in uh, about a half an hour or 40 minutes, but first I want to go over a couple more examples in the method of variation of parameters. So our first example is d2y by dt squared minus t plus 2 over t dy by dt plus t plus 2 over t squared y equals 2t and our interval will be 0 to infinity the open interval t is greater than 0 and we'll take initial conditions y of 1 to be 2 and dy by dt of 1 to be 6. We have to give the initial conditions in a place where the coefficients are continuous. These are not continuous at t equals 0, so we're working in the positive t domain. All right. <clears throat> so, now, generally, our approach will be we want to find two linearly independent solutions of the homogeneous equation, and then we will use those to help us construct a particular solution of the non-homogeneous equation. Now, there are no methods for solving every ODE, even though it be linear, with non-constant coefficients, methods which aren't numerical, analytical methods. However, there are some ways one can approximate solutions. We won't be covering them in this class, but we will always be working with examples where it is not too hard to guess at least one solution. And once we have won the solution of the homogeneous second order equation, we can reduce the problem of finding a second linearly independent solution to that of solving a first order equation, method of reduction of order. So let's follow that prescription. Here, a solution of the homogeneous equation has the solution y1 of t is t. One can see that because if I substitute t into the homogeneous equation with 0 on the right hand side, I get t and this big term becomes t plus 2 over t. dy by dt is 1. This is minus t plus 2 over t. And this is 0. So that's an exact solution. Now, having that as an exact solution, reduction of order method, we seek y2 in the form of y1 
times V, which is here TV. This tells me that dy by dt, dy2 by dt rather, is TV prime plus V. And d2y2 by dt squared is TV double prime plus 2V prime. Okay, that's what you get. You differentiate once, you get this. Differentiate again, you get this. Now, you substitute this in the equation. TV double prime plus 2V prime minus T plus 2 over T times TV prime plus V then plus T plus 2 over T squared times TV and that's 0. And we want to find the V that satisfies that equation. Now one of the good things that happen of course is that the terms proportional to V cancel and so I am just left with an equation for V prime. From here, the T's cancel. That T cancels with that. So this is TV double prime plus 2V prime minus TV prime minus 2V prime. So the whole equation just becomes T times V double prime minus V prime equals zero. Is that all right? TV double prime plus 2V prime. The 2V prime cancels with that minus 2V prime because the T's cancel here. And I'm left with minus TV prime. I take out the T and I get this very simple equation. So I want, since T is greater than zero, this is V double prime minus V prime equals zero. This says that V prime is AE to the T, and therefore V is AE to the T plus B, and therefore our second solution, Y2, Y2 is AT, uh, sorry, AE to the T plus B times T, which is this linear combination of TE to the T plus B times T. This will be linearly independent from this. Y2, Y1 are linearly independent if A is non-zero. So you could pick any value of A and any value of B as long as this isn't zero. You'll get a non-zero Ronskin. However, the most convenient choice, convenient choice, would be A equals 1, B equals 0. So the second solution then would be T E to the T. Because we're going to take a linear combination anyway. So we might as well work with the simplest version of the second linearly independent solution. Question? This? This is a first order equation. Write V prime equal U. This is du by dt minus U equals zero. You solve that many times. That's the solution. All right. So we now have the second linearly independent solution. Now we can seek a particular solution of the non-homogeneous non the non-homogeneous equation in the form yp is y1, which is t, v1, plus t, e to the t, v2. Differentiate yp prime will be v1 plus 
And when I take the derivative of the te to the t, I get t plus 1 e to the t, v2. Then I get the terms with the derivatives of v1 and v2, which are t v1 prime plus t e to the t v2 prime. Now, I use my one degree of freedom because I have two unknown functions here. I only have to satisfy one equation with yp. So I will choose the relation between v1 and v2 to be this. Now I don't have any further choices. The v1s and the v2s have to satisfy the equation. So now I take the second derivative, yp double prime, and I get v1 prime plus t plus 1 times e to the t v2 prime, then the derivative of this times v2, which is t plus 2 v2. Now I substitute these three expressions into the non-homogeneous equation. What will I get? I get v1 prime plus t plus 1 e to the t v2 prime plus t plus 2 e to the t v2. That's the first term. The second term will be minus t plus 2 over t times v1 plus t plus 1 e to the t times v2. Then finally the last term will be plus t plus 2 over t squared times t v1 plus t e to the t v2 and that all has to equal 2t and I just had a barely enough space. <coughs> So, this is the expression I get by substituting these forms into the full non-homogeneous equation. Yes? V1 double prime. No. Here? No, V1 prime. Because... Because yp prime, the v1 double prime part and the v2 double prime part has been made zero by demanding this combination. So you never get a v1 or v2 double prime. Right? Now, if I've been good, yes. Sorry? How did I get this? This, remember the method says, you seek solutions in the form y1 times v1 plus y2 times v2, where y1 and y2 are solutions, two linearly independent solutions of the homogeneous equation. Yes? Which this one here? Okay, when I differentiate this, I get the differential of this is this. When I differentiate this product, the differential of the V2 gives me this times this. Then plus this times, oh, I need another e to the t here. So I need the differential of this, which is just t plus 2 e to the t. So where does that go? Yes. In fact, I had written it down correctly here. Now, what you'll find is, if you look at the terms, say, with V1 in them, this cancels with that. If you look at the terms, the coefficient of the terms of V2, they will disappear as well. This and this and this will add to zero. That's because, in general, the coefficients 
of v1 will be d2y1 by dt squared plus p of t dy1 by dt plus q of t y1. So you're always going to get zero coefficients for both the v1 and the v2. Now I'm left with a very easy equation, which is v1 prime plus t plus 1 e to the t v2 prime equals 2t. Now I couple this with this equation, this free choice that I've made, and I will divide out the t, which I can do because t is greater than 0. So I get my second equation, v1 prime plus um, e to the t, v2 prime, equals 0. So now I have two equations, two equations, and two unknowns. The unknowns are v1 prime and v2 prime, and I know all these coefficients. So these are just now algebraic equations for v1 prime and v2 prime. To solve for v to solve for v2 prime, if I subtract those two equations, this cancels with this. This term cancels with the 1 times e to the t v2 prime. And I'm just left with t e to the t v2 prime equals 2t. So I subtract. And I find that v2 prime is nothing other than 2e to the minus t. Because e to the t, or t e to the t v2 prime is 2t. So e to the t v2 prime is 2. Our v2 prime is 2 times e to the minus t. The v1 prime, I get by just going back here, v1 prime is minus e to the t v2 prime. Well, that's easy. So that's minus 2. So v1 prime is minus e to the t times v2 prime. v2 prime is this. So the e to the t and e to the minus t gives e to the 0, which is 1. Now these are really easy to solve. This tells me that v2 is minus 2e to the minus t plus c2, constant c2. This is also easy to solve. This tells me that v1 is equal to minus 2t plus c1. Then, any particular solution, the yp, is going to be t times v1. plus t e to the t times v2 and this is equal to minus 2 t squared from here and then I have a t term which is the the factor c1 from here and from here minus 2 plus Finally, C2 times TE to the T. <clears throat> so, we in fact get the general solution is minus 2T squared, and we can call this A, if you like, because C1, a constant, an arbitrary constant minus 2, we can call another arbitrary constant, we'll call it A, and the C2 we'll call B. So the solution is y of t is minus 2t squared plus at plus b times t e to the t. That is the general solution. In order to find a and b, you use the initial conditions that y of 1 is 2, 
and dy by dt of 1 is 6. And I'll leave you to do that. Or does anybody need me to do that? Now, if you come down to this point, you can always check. This is a solution of the homogeneous equation. This guy has to be a solution of the non-homogeneous equation. So if you substitute this in to the full equation, this equation up here, then indeed you will find minus 2t squared is a solution of the homogeneous equation. Notice a couple of things I want to remind you of. In particular, make sure sometimes you might be given an equation with, say, t squared here. This could have been given to you as t squared, d2y by dt squared, minus t plus 2 dy by dt, plus t plus 2y, sorry, it would be t times t plus 2 here, and then just t plus 2 here, equals 2t cubed. Make sure that you divide things out so that we always have a 1 here, because that's the standard form of the equation. It's no use having this guy continuous if this guy here can have zeros. So always start by dividing out what is ever here. It may be t-dependent. And starting with a 1 here, and then whatever is here divided by whatever is here is what we call the p of t. So don't forget that, that we, the canonical form of our equation is with a 1 here. Right. And the second message is you can always check your solutions. Now, any questions? You see the form of the solution? Well, I'm going to give you another chance to. Right? Now, so a second example d2y by dt squared plus y equals cos omega t. y of 0 is uh, 0. dy by dt of 0 is 0. Now, this is one of the examples you could have solved by the method of undetermined coefficients. And you would have found that the solution is cos omega t minus cos t over 1 minus omega squared. If you look for a particular solution proportional to cos omega t, you won't need the sign because there's no first derivative here. So you just can see if I look for a solution c cos omega t, this will give me minus omega squared cos omega t plus 1 times cos omega t, and that has to match this. So c is 1 over 1 minus omega squared. But anyway, and then you have to add this is the part of the homogeneous solution in order to make sure that this and this are satisfied. So this is really straightforward by the method of undetermined coefficients. Let's just get a taste for the amount of work you might have to go through if you're solving it with our uh, variation of parameters method. So what are the two solutions of the homogeneous equation, two linearly independent solutions of the homogeneous equation? Okay, d2y by dt squared plus y equals 0. Cos and sine t, yeah. So I would look for a particular solution then, v1 cos t plus v2 sine t where the v1 and v2 are time dependent, the yp prime will give me minus v1 sine t plus v2 cos t, and then another term where we have both of these, the derivatives of the v1 and the v2. 
I have one free choice. I make this zero. And now yp prime is this. Now I differentiate again. Now I have to take account of the fact that v1 and v2 are time dependent. So this is sine t plus v2 prime cos t, then minus v1 cos t minus v2 sine t. Now, if I substitute this into this equation, y double prime plus y, this part cancels. And so I'm just left with this guy, minus v1 prime <coughs> sine t, plus v2 prime cos t, equals cos omega t. So my two equations are this one, which is v1 prime cos t, plus v2 prime sine t is zero, and minus v1 prime sine t, plus v2 prime cos t equals cos omega t. Everybody happy with that? Now, to solve. How do you solve? Well, if I multiply this guy by cosine and this guy by minus sine, I will get from this one v1 prime cos squared plus sine squared, which is 1. And these two will cancel. So I'll find that v1 prime equals minus sine t cos omega t. If I work the other way, multiply this guy by sine, this guy by cosine, then these two terms will cancel, and I'll find that v2 prime times sine squared plus cos squared, which is 1, is plus cos t cos omega t. Now, first little challenge. You've done this before. Mass 129. Remember that? Mm-hmm. And you're all very good at, how, how do I integrate that? This is straightforward integration. How do I integrate sine, what, uh, what do I have here? I have a sine t cos omega t. How do I do that? What? You look up the table. No, not trig substitution. That, what? U substitution. Yeah, but if I make omega t equal u, then I'll get the other t won't be very nice. Now, do you remember that sine A cos B, what it is? This is minus a half sine of the sum minus sine of the difference. Actually, the plus the sine of the difference. If, if I, this is sine a plus b plus sine of a minus b will be 2 sine a cos b. This guy will be a half cosine one minus omega t plus cosine one plus omega t. Now it's not too hard to integrate them, is it? Now you can integrate. All right? So I'm going to leave this as a little exercise for you. I want you to do 
exercise finish when you integrate this this will integrate up to cos 1 plus omega t over 1 plus omega with a negative sign which will get rid of that this will integrate up to minus cos 1 minus omega t over 1 minus omega this guy will integrate up to sine of 1 minus omega t over 1 minus omega and this sine of 1 plus omega t over 1 plus omega now you put the v1 and v2 back in here and now you'll have expressions like cos t cos 1 plus omega t and you'll get another sine 1 plus omega t times sine t and by recombining them again with the rules sine a plus b and sine a minus b and cos a plus b and cos a minus b you will end up simply getting the first term here you'll get the first term here in this expression the free constants will give you a c times cos t plus b times or d times sine t that's the solution of the homogeneous equation then to satisfy those initial conditions to satisfy those initial conditions you will find the coefficient here has to be just minus 1 over 1 minus omega squared and the coefficient of the sine is 0 so I would like you to finish that I would also like you to do the following problem a second exercise which is d2y by dt squared plus y equals tan t say given y naught is a and dy by dt of naught is b now this even though the left hand side has constant coefficients the right hand side the tan t does not belong to that set of functions for which the method of undetermined coefficients works because the trouble is if you differentiate tan t you keep getting new things so you have to do this by the method of variation of parameters or variation of constants in other words you have to do this via this method so you would do the very same as we did here except the only change will be you'll come to this point and instead of having cos omega t on the right hand side you'll have tan t on the right hand side so instead of having cos omega t here for this example here you will have tan t on the right hand side when you find what v1 prime is it will be sine t times tan t minus sine t times tan t now what's sine t times tan t it's sine squared t over cos t but sine squared is 1 minus cos squared so I have 1 minus cos squared t over cos t so it's a secant and a cosine both of which you can integrate so you will be able to integrate, find what v1 prime, v, or for v1 is and v2 is, and therefore solve this problem. Now I will hand out the solutions. I'll put them up on D2L, but I want you to do this yourselves before you see the actual solution. Because one of the things I have found <laughs> is that a lot of you know the method very well but you screw up when it comes to doing 
simple integrations which require the use of trig formulae. Yes, I know, you hated them, but unfortunately, until we discover another way of describing circular functions, <laughs> we're going to have to live with sine t and cos t because they turn up very naturally a lot of the time. So I want you to do this as uh, this could very well turn up on exam number two. It's a nice problem because it doesn't, it's not too long, you see. It would be an ideal problem to come up on exam two. Anyway, so those are two exercises and like I say, I will post the solutions, but I want you to try first to get them. Okay? Any questions now on this method of variation of parameters? Yes? Very good question. Yes. You have you have one unknown. You want to get a particular solution, y p of t. It has to satisfy. It is a constraint on it. It has to satisfy this differential equation, or this differential equation, or that one. It turns out very convenient to seek a solution in this form. That, um, where did I write it down for the gentleman here? Yes, in this form. Why? Because when you do that, and you differentiate several times, all the terms proportional to V2 will vanish. But this guy has a disadvantage in the sense that it has two unknown functions that you have to determine. You only wanted a solution of the original equation, but now you've put, given yourself two unknown functions to determine. We can always set arbitrarily one relation between those two functions. The choice, our special choice of that relation, will be when we differentiate this guy, we will take out, we will make zero the terms which essentially treat v1 and v2 as time dependent. Now they are time dependent, but we will take, we will choose that this expression here, this part of the expression, is zero. Now, once I've made this choice, I have no more free choices to make. What remains, I have to take account of the fact that v1 and v2 are time dependent, and they have to satisfy the equation. Okay, so I've given myself one degree of freedom by introducing two new functions. And I choose the method, this method chooses to exercise that degree of freedom, that free choice, by putting that equal to zero, that combination equal to zero. It's saying the V2, it's saying the V2 that you choose here isn't independent of the V1. You want to choose this V2 to be such that that is zero. Now, when you continue, now what you're left with has to satisfy the equation. You have no more free choices. If we were working with a third order system, we would be looking for three linearly independent solutions of the homogeneous equation. And we'd seek particular solutions of the non-homogeneous equation in the form v1y1 plus v2y2 plus v3y3. Then, when we differentiate this once, we would have v1 prime y1 plus v2 prime y2 plus v3 prime y3 sitting here. We will choose to make that zero. When I differentiate again, I will get a term with v1 prime times y1 prime plus v2 prime times y2 prime plus v3 prime times y3 prime. I will choose to make that zero. 
You see, in that case, I have two free choices. Because I have one function that has to satisfy the equation, but I introduce three unknowns, v1, v2, v3. I choose two relations between them, and then the third gets determined. And what happens is you get relations essentially just like this. Now, I have written this out. If you look in D2L at the matrix formulation of the problem, I explain how this actually comes very naturally, that comes out in that formulation. All right? Yeah, let me, let me write up in, in general what we'll have. <clears throat> If we have an equation of order n, so supposing I have dn y by dtn plus p1 of t, dn minus 1 y by dtn minus 1, all the way down to pn of t times y equals g of t. I will Imagine that I can find n linearly independent solutions of the homogeneous equation. I will then seek the particular solution in the form v1y1 plus v2y2 plus up to vnyn. I will make the free choices I now have n minus 1 free choices because I only have to satisfy one equation, but I've introduced n unknown functions. I will choose v1 prime times y1 plus v2 prime times y2 up to vn times yn equals 0. I will choose v1 prime times y1 prime plus v2 prime times y2 prime up to vn prime times yn prime equals zero. And I will go all the way up to the n minus second derivative. Here. <coughs> Um, no, n minus first derivative. <coughs> okay, times y n times the n minus one derivative. And this guy will turn out to be equal to the right hand side g of t. So you can see that the algebraic equations I get with this method have essentially the Ronskin of the linearly independent solutions as the coefficient matrix. So the method is the very same in principle as we have carried out for the second order case. Is that a bit more clear? You don't like it. <laughs> yes? Does that form over there always hold? Yes. So technically, if we find, like, derived y of t, we can just go straight to that and save some work? You can, as long as you know how to do it. As long as you know where it comes from. Because there's great danger in jumping into the middle and relying on memory. OK? Make sure. It's always a good idea, you know, to have to remember as few things as possible. Hmm? Passwords, for example. How many, how many passwords do you have? Three. Three. <laughs> do you have a new, good mnemonic to remember them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How many people have more than three passwords? 
How do you remember them all? It is? Yeah, but which, which variation goes to your bank account and which variation goes to your girlfriend's account or your email? Or... Ah, yes, but if you go away for holidays in the summer, what happens then? I know you're kind of coming back, forgot password, click. Yeah. How many of you think that, do you think now, now 10 years from now, we'll be still using passwords? How many think that we will? And how many think there'll be another means of identifying you? What, what would you say it'll be? Well, probably the fingerprint scan. Fingerprint scan. <laughs> Trouble with fingerprints. Um, I like fingerprints myself because I've actually written papers on why they occur. But, I mean, I, I've studied them a bit. But some people have lousy fingerprints. How, do, you, do you use the rec center? Uh, yeah, but I use the car. But I know they have those, like, finger scanners. Exactly. Why don't you use the finger scanner? <laughs> but you just told me that the future is fingerprints. Uh, I see. So, so you can touch your laptop and it'll recognize you. Do you have to put it really flat on, a thumb? Yeah. I see. And it always works for you. Works every time. You must have good fingerprints. But some people actually have very poor, not deep fingerprints. Yeah? What, what, what do you say? Uh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to shout a bit. Yeah. I see. So, so the, the, the imprint, the, the remains of the imprint, yeah. How about sticking your eyeball up to your computer screen? Huh? Who thinks eyeballs will be? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I imagine there'll be the technology, but given there's probably going to be a ton of paranoia about health dangers that uh, yeah. prevent proper education. Yeah, health dangers, paranoia, yes, they're familiar. Yeah. All right. So. At this stage, at this stage now, I expect that you are all very good at solving second order, linear, non-homogeneous equations. And um, there's lots of examples in the trial exam number two, or the mock exam number two, or indeed in the lectures 16 through 21. Exam number two will be focused on the material up to the present point and maybe one or two little things about what we're going to talk about for the remainder of the course. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about situations which can be described by pairs of ODEs. dx by dt is some function of x and y. Generally speaking, generally speaking, problems that come as second order systems will in fact also have a time dependence in the right hand side. But we'll be studying that class for which there is no time dependence on the right hand side. In other words, I have two dependent variables x and y. dx by dt is some function of x and y and dy by dt is another function of x and y. For example, for example, if I look at the pendulum, if I look at the pendulum, If I take the simple pendulum, and my angle here is theta, so I have a big heavy mass here swinging backwards and forwards. When I used to teach this class in, in PAS 201, 
one of the great advantages there was the physics technical expert was right next door and he had this most wonderful pendulum. Now, have any of you in physics seen the pass as it's been demonstrated? So, you have this big ball, I mean it must be what, about 15 feet in, in length, the, 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 the length of the string, and then you have this big heavy ball on the end, and it'll swing backwards and forwards. <coughs> now the equation, if this is the length m, l, it's <coughs> the mass times l, d2 theta by dt squared, and then you may have a bit of damping, minus, uh, we'll call it, uh, b times l times d theta by dt, and then the restoring force will be minus mg sine theta. Why is that the restoring force? Well, mg acts directly down. This angle here is theta, so the, this angle here between the pen, between that direction and the vertical is theta, so you have mg cos theta, force that the, that the hinge feels, and then an mg sine theta in this direction, <coughs> which bring, it's a restoring force, it's like a spring restoring force bringing the pendulum back towards the middle, swinging backwards and forwards. But <coughs> we're all grown up now, so we're not going to write this as just theta, we're not just going to consider small swings, we're going to consider big swings of this pendulum, okay? So we're going to be asking ourselves how to analyze such an equation. And if I divide across by ml, this becomes d2 theta by dt squared equals minus b over m d theta by dt minus g over l sine theta. Now, if I replace, if I call theta x and d theta by dt y, then I just get this equation here, except instead of the b, I'd get b over m. Right? I would get a pair of equations. dx by dt is y, and dy by dt is this. Now, you guys can actually go to your JODE write down when on the first equation dx by dt is y and the second equation this. If you write down sine x, write it as sin bracket x, okay? And you'll be able to look and see. You, you can watch for orbits that swing up and down like this. Did the guy in physics ever, there's a conservation of energy here. If you have no damping, of course, the total energy will be conserved. And a good way of demonstrating that is to stand over in the corner of the room. You take this big heavy ball and you let it swing. And if you really believe in conservation of energy and don't move, the ball will just come back to your nose. If you happen to move forward slightly, that's rough. Okay, because there's very little damping in that swing. Anyway, that's, that's uh, so we'll be analyzing the various behaviors of the pendulum. It's rather interesting. I mean, maybe you'd like to just explore, because the, the different kinds of orbits, I mean, one kind of orbit, of course, is swinging backwards and forwards like this, right? But what's another possible orbit? Yeah, go over the top, you know, give it a good push, you know, up and over and over and so on. Now if you have damping, you might go up and over a few times, but then you start to swing back like this, down, down, down. Okay, so we will learn to analyze that system. Another system, which is very interesting, is the so-called predator-prey model. Here, this is a very interesting model as you'll see from the results, think of X as the population of rabbits. Y is the population of foxes. This guy, this equation says, 
think of population, dx by dt, rabbits multiply, right? So a is positive. dx by dt is ax. In other words, rabbits left to themselves will produce more rabbits exponentially. But when they reach the limit of the environment, the facilities, there'll be saturation. And you might allow hunting of rabbits. Now, the interaction with foxes is a very interesting term. It says that the number of rabbits will go down roughly proportional to the probability of a fox meeting a rabbit. And roughly the probability of a fox meeting a rabbit is proportional to the product of the population of rabbits times the population of foxes. So the rabbit population will be kept in check by saturation, hunting, and foxes. Now foxes, on the other hand, actually aren't very productive. And there's not much food except rabbits around for them. So they would die out left to themselves. Their only hope of survival is to meet the occasional rabbit. And the probability they'll meet the occasional rabbit will be modeled by this product again, xy. So, question, what do you think is the, I mean, it's very interesting, we can forget about saturation and hunting. What do you think will happen, actually, in such a situation, if you just have the equations to the left of the blue line? What do you think? Anybody have any idea? I mean, think of what, what do you think the graph of the rabbits will look like? Yes. Yeah, you've been reading Wikipedia again, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, no, you're quite correct. I mean, this is in the xy plane, it'll do this, but in the x versus t, you'll get a surge of rabbits, and then it'll drop. As, and, and, and then as they drop, the foxes will come in. And then when there's very few rabbits, of course, the number of foxes drop. And in fact, you get this wonderful uh, uh, periodic cycling between population of rabbits and foxes. And you know, for a long time, uh, people who didn't understand this dynamics uh, were worried. For instance, in, in Canada, uh, there was some situation where lynxes and anyway there was a predator and a prey animal and uh, you know they were looking at data and the data showed the number of the prey had dropped dangerously low but in fact it was only part of this natural cycle of back and forth of course you have to be very careful that it doesn't drop too low because you have other effects like this and this that can kill things out altogether but we're going to look at the influence of such effects on this basic predator-prey cycle. By the way, chemistry, in chemistry often the amount of a new substance produced, if you have two substances x, y, and you're producing another substance z, dz by dt is often proportional to the product of the uh, two substances which make this new molecule. And the reason for that is very simple. Like rabbits and foxes, the molecules are just running around at random, and the probability of this molecule meeting this molecule will be roughly proportional to the density of each molecule, <laughs> molecule present. So this is why this quadratic, uh, 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 this quadratic a term here is a good model of, of this interaction. Now, somebody was going to get me some equations for chemistry, right? Chemical reactions. Who was that? I think it was you. I haven't seen them yet. 
this is another interesting example. There's lots of interesting examples we'll talk about. Maybe you'll come up with some. This is um, in, uh, in about 19, the 1950s, two guys, Hodgkin and Huxley, came up with equations for how electrical pulses run along nerve axons. And um, they're, they're not too complicated, the equations, but they have more variables in them than two. However, principally, the main effects, the main behaviors of the electrical pulses along nerve axons are given by essentially just taking two variables into account. One here, I should have written this is x, and this is x, and this is y, and this is x, and this is y. Or else you can put uh, dv by dt over here and dw by dt here. Essentially, V is the voltage difference across a membrane. And this is called the fitzhugh nagumo equations. And essentially, they describe nerve pulses traveling along nerve axons. And they're extraordinarily good, extraordinarily reliable. And in fact, they're used quite a lot in, in, uh, in uh, real uh, neurobiology and so on. So um, what I'd like you guys to do is maybe come up with examples of sets of, sets of second order autonomous systems. For the electrical engineers, you might look up something called the Van der Poel oscillator. It's not unlike the fitzhugh nagumo equations, but that's a, that gives you actually periodic cycles in current or, or charge or whatever you want uh, cycles in. Um, mixing of fluids, actually. It turns out there, uh, the first example I give in the set of lecture notes. So the lecture notes for this part of the course are lecture notes 22 to 30. So you might start downloading those and starting to read that part of the course. So next day, we'll be talking about, essentially, equations which fall into this category. Now, are you all ready for the exam? It's Thursday week, right? Thursday, two weeks. Thursday, today, two weeks. Now, you're a very good class, so I want you all to do very well. I want you to live up to your potentials. How many of you scored full marks yesterday? Good for you guys. Good for you guys. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, yeah. We'll be back to partial credit when it comes to the big exams. But, all right. So that's all I had to say today. So go home. Thanks.